Hi, Founder fans. Jason here. And today's founder is Henry Light Horse Harry Lee. And to help us talk about Henry Light Horse Harry Lee, we are joined by Ryan Cole. Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Absolutely. And for those watching, the reason you're talking about Henry Lee is because you came out with a book about Henry Lee not so long ago. That's right. In 2019, a biography of Light Horse Harry Lee. There are others uh, that have come out over the, the decades, but um, I try to concentrate on the whole story of Lee's life rather than, uh, you know, focusing on his service during the Revolutionary War, because it's, you know, I've said so many times during promoting this book is that Hamilton's life made a beloved musical, but Lee's would have made an incredibly tragic and frightening opera. Well, let's talk about that opera for a minute. So what most people know Henry Lee for, he's part of the Lee family of Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. and he served bravely in the Revolutionary War itself. Uh, do you know approximately how old he was when he fought in the war? Well, he was born in 1756, and his service began in 1777, so... Young. Do the math. <laughs> what was that, uh, 20... 21? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we do history here, not math. <laughs> Very interesting. But as a young man, uh, he participated in a lot of battles. I, I understand he was, I don't want to say cavalry. Was he was he cavalry or dragoon? Yeah. Is that the right word? Yes, that is the right word. I think w when you talk about his military service, one of the most interesting things about it was he knew George Washington. If we had a map, we could illustrate. Lee grew up, uh, the Lee estate, not to be confused with Stratford Hall, which he later be the lord of through marriage, but he was born in Leesylvania, which is in Prince William County in uh, Virginia. And his father, Henry Lee II, was a friend and colleague of George Washington, who of course lived, they both, the Leesylvania was on the Potomac. So just uh, up the river from Leesylvania was Mount Vernon. So Lee spent time growing up around Washington. And when he finished uh, college at Princeton, then College of New Jersey, he uh, is at Right as the the war, on the eve of the war, he's invited to Mount Vernon, where he is in the uh, company of Washington and also Charles Lee, unrelated Charles Lee, who I think you probably covered, right? Sure. Uh, well, there's they, a, there uh, is a Charles Lee cousin that's related right. who would be attorney general, but that's a different conversation. Different, <laughs> different one. Yeah, this is the one who I always love to say who preferred the company of dogs to men. So uh, um, he's at that dinner with these two, these two uh, great in the colonies, stature, military stature was, you know, peerless. So that is a heady dinner that he attends with them. And he leaves it determined to participate in the revolution. And he is not afraid to, you know, take advantage of any connections, family connections that he has. So during his time in the Northern theater, he is, he's close to Washington and Washington is usually, even though, and we'll get into this, he's, Lee is a problematic personality to put it lightly. But of course, many soldiers and generals in the uh, Continental Army were as well. But Washington is usually a pretty loyal supporter and advances his career throughout his participation in the war, at least in the Northern Theater. Yeah. And so I understand he, like I said, he participates in a whole mess of different battles uh, or in skirmishes. Is there any particular engagement that stands out to you as important in Lee's well, life? Yeah, if we break it down into the theaters, I always looked at it, it, it covered it in the book in terms of his participation in the North, which is connected to his relationship with Washington, and then his participation in the Southern theater, which is him, his relationship with Nathaniel Green. And both those relationships are really interesting too. Uh, I would say the thing about Lee is that, yes, he was, he participated in some of the battles that the we know the ones that are, you know, more part of the common memory. But he's, you know, his reputation is based on skirmishes, on battles between enemy lines, on raids. And so there's two, really quickly, I would say there's two. There's a, during the winter, the Valley Forge winter, he is posted up at a, a Scots farmhouse 
which is west of Philadelphia, occupied Philadelphia, and the uh, British are determined, he's causing so, such trouble with his raids, they're determined to trap him at this house. And, you know, they send an army of, I believe it was, you know, 80, and he had about eight men at his disposal, and they blow back the British during, you know, the wee hours of the morning. And Washington is, you know, it's tactically insignificant, obviously, but Washington is so energized by those odds. And it's not long after that, Washington, this is very, typically, very, this is, you know, famous, Washington offers Lee, he sends Hamilton, in fact. And by the way, we should, you know, point out for your viewers Lee is a founding father, right? We know his history remembers him a little bit more as a father of Robert E. Lee, but he's actually a founding father. And, you know, he's a comrade of Hamilton. He goes to college with Madison, right? And Washington is a mentor. Jefferson is his nemesis. So he's he's in that generation. I think it's important. I, that's why I love that you included him in your founder of the day, because he is a founder. When you but, mentioned the year he was at Princeton, I was like, that's about when James Madison was hanging out. Yeah, they, were, they were there together. And Aaron Burr also. Right. It was an incredible, you know, the, Princeton was like the, you know, one of the hotbeds of, of revolutionary thought, obviously, because of Witherspoon. But, you know, to get back to the, the so after the Scots farmhouse engagement, Washington eventually says he sends Hamilton to extend the invitation to Lee to join his inner circle, the administrative circle, you know, of all these these great connections folding out of that, you know, you're it's a safer job, obviously, it's more prestigious. And Lee writes a letter to Washington declining, saying, I'm wedded to my sword, my military reputation is my priority. So he essentially tells Washington, thanks, but no thanks, it's a, it's a great opportunity. And Washington doesn't bat an eye. Washington says, you know, think nothing of it. In fact, in the future, I will find more opportunities for you to, you know, achieve your ambition. So, so that then leads to answer to long way of answering your question to Paul's hook, which is, you know, kind of in your neck of the woods, right? Not too far. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. That's what um, I understand to be his great, not greatest, but I believe he gets a, an award for Policy. That's a, that's right. It's he Washington kind of gives him the authority to plan, and he does that. And it's funny you can read the correspondence between them. The original raid it was thought to be an impregnable uh, British installation that the British had taken over early part of the war. And and Lee his original plan I think Washington was hesitant, and Lee eventually has to convince him that it'll work. And he leads the whole thing. He orchestrates it. It's successful. They don't lose any men. And then you know you're right. It's it's really kind of the apex of his military reputation during the war, but in typical Lee fashion, you know, almost immediately after, again, we have to kind of get into Lee's personality along the way he, he um, irritates so many other soldiers. He's young, he has all these military connections. He's from Virginia's first family. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of antagonism, right? And so immediately after the Pulse Hook raid, uh, a number of soldiers, American soldiers come forward and, um, the, the primary, there was a, a whole series of charges. He's court-martialed. One of them is that he misstated uh, the date of his commission during the, right before the, the raid to an officer who whose commission predated Lee's. So he ends up being so just, you know, this moment of glory, which he had planned, incredibly ambitious young man who wants all these, these military laurels. He plans this raid, it's successful, and then immediately afterwards he's court-martialed. So it's like, there's the Lee, that's kind of the, the, the repeating arc in Lee's life uh, on display there. Now he, he's cleared, and you're right, Congress gives him a, a congressional a gold medal. He's the only uh, soldier beneath the rank of general during the revolution who receives one, actually. Although he never actually, he does, never actually gets the medal. He's still in his, uh, towards the end of his life, is still trying to get the medal. There was oh, one really? rock, but he never, yeah, he never gets it. So that's interesting. Again, and, another and very to, typical Lee. And, and to comment on the, the date for, of the commission, that would be important because the earlier the commission, the higher the rank, if I'm not mistaken. That's exactly right. Thank you. Right. Yeah, so, right. so the question was in the peak of the battle, um, there's a conversation about what, you know, why are you leading this? And when did you receive your commission? And Lee apparently misstates. It. So it's to uh, make sure that he is going to lead the battle. He's not going to let go of that. So he ends up, like I said, he ends up being court-martialed. He's cleared. He defends himself, of course, and um, immediately after that. But the thing is, again, this is kind of building into the story, is that his, you have this moment of glory and it's tarnished by these jealous uh, fellow soldiers 
and it's it very much wounds his ego and you know, this is something that he carries through to the end of his time in I'm the war sure. he's not the only one you hear several people huh. notably benedict arnold <laughs> there are yeah. many no, I, people I, you know a I lot of people say. from new hampshire actually <laughs> Yeah, it was a you know a whole army full of divas, and this is one thing about about writing a book about Lee, or about uh, you know almost any of these these men is that Washington comes across as you really understand how indispensable Washington was because he was able to manage these guys and he was able to see the talents and you know keep his eyes focused on that instead of being distracted by the drama and the ego and the pettiness. And Lee's a great example. He saw he obviously valued Lee tremendously. But he had to, you know, and Green too. They had to put up with a lot of nonsense. Nonsense isn't the right word, but a lot of unsolicited advice, you know. Right. And I'm a lot you, of. I'm glad you add Nathaniel Green to that. Nathaniel Green, of all the people who doesn't get the credit they deserve, Nathaniel Green is way up on that list. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm still waiting for the definitive bio. It seems like that someone should be writing one. Some Imagine. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought I heard a few years ago that David McCullough was writing one, but I guess that never happened. Really? You're right. Yeah. He's one of the few people who doesn't. But let's continue yeah. with Light Horse Harry. Uh, okay. So we've gone through the war at this point. There's We could probably talk for six hours about the war itself, but uh, let's move through the war because he has a long life afterwards. I understand in the mid to late 1780s, he works his way up through state politics. Yeah, that's right. Well, so just to close out the war really quickly, okay. Washington sends him to the south. Uh, to to join with Green's army and that kind of unconventional blending of you know I guess you would call it guerrilla tactics uh, you know in a tandem with the the main army and he collaborates with um, Francis Marion the War of Posts the Race to the Dan he participates Utah Springs and, and Guilford Courthouse he's there at some pretty important battles but what ends up ultimately happens is that Green loves him you know he. You look at the little correspondence he offers again he offers green so much unsolicited advice some of it kind of you know out there and green's very patient but eventually as the you know right after yorktown he he's sent to yorktown to carry a, a message to washington so he's present but not as a soldier i mean not and not as a participant i should say he's sent uh, to carry a message to to washington that green would like more reinforcements you know after the Georgetown campaign is over. So you gotta think about it. This is incredibly uh, vain, ambitious young soldier is there at this incredible moment, important moment, and he's not really a participant. So this is really, you know, he's, you could say, you could, I didn't really get into this. You could say he has, you know, PTSD, he's tired. He's been fighting the war for, I think, you know, seven years at this point, I believe. Um, his ambitions have been frustrated. So he ends up quitting. He essentially quits and goes home. He quits on Green, and there's a wonderful series of correspondence between the two, where Green tries to convince him not to leave the army and go back to Virginia. And the one line that I always remember reading was he says to Lee when he's finally reconciled to the fact that Lee is leaving, he says, "You'll go home, you'll get married, but you will never cease to be a soldier." And I think when we start talking about Lee's life away from the war, that is very much the truth: is that his transition from um, life in the army to life as a civilian is not smooth. It's very rocky. Well, that's the perfect segue. So well, yeah. let's talk a little bit about his life after the war. He does go home and get married. He goes home. Yeah, he gets married very well. He always married very well. He marries his cousin, Matilda Lee, well, who is the heir <laughs> of Stratford Hall, right? Yeah. And um, so by marrying her, he becomes the Lord of Stratford Hall, beautiful Georgian mansion on the Potomac. And he tries his hand at being a, a farmer, right? But he's he's not George Washington. He doesn't have the patience for this. Um, he tries his hand immediately. And again, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is not particular to Lee. And you know this, is that when we talk about speculating in land, this was a very common addiction amongst founders like Robert Morris, uh, James Did Wilson. you call it who, addiction? That, addiction? That is a perfect way to describe it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and just kind of the, the way to explain it was the sense that you have a, a new country, right? And the population is going to move west and waterways are going to be open. Roads are going to be built and people are going to move west. Commerce is going to move west. And there's money to be made by buying this land now on the cheap and selling it as it becomes more viable. And Lee was just incredibly starry eyed about this, but had very little actual, I think, talent at it. And very quickly, even, you know, this is we're into the 1780s now even at this early point it was very clear that he couldn't manage he, he couldn't keep track of all the land he was buying 
And this is just ends up really being his undoing. You can already see the seeds of it, uh, you know, as he's transitioning away from the army and beginning yeah. his life. You, I love that you point that out about the moving West. I mean, I like to reiterate here that of the dozens of reasons the revolution began, a major one for people who weren't, you know, who were living in the South is the proclamation of 1763, where the king said, you can't go West anymore. And they were like, we just fought the seven years war for that land. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So like, that's why people were so eager after the revolution to start speculating. Yeah, absolutely. And he, there he was, he was, he was, you know, and like I said, he was not the only one. He was, he was one of many. I think he was probably particularly ill-suited to do it, you know, so. So he's not great at farming and he's not great at speculation. No, what, I think this is someone who, who wants the life of excitement and action. So he quickly drifts into politics. He's in the, he's in the Continental Congress. One thing I think Lee doesn't get enough um, respect for is that he's very much, this is someone who's a big a student of history, who's very much, I think, drawn to the glory of military feats and affairs it's very it's, this is something that's you know he states in correspondence but you know since we're on the subject of the, the founding when he's in the continental congress one thing i thought was really founding was uh, fascinating was that he is very early on pushes for a um monument to nathaniel green who had died you know died i think around the time that he takes his seat he in, dies pretty quick yeah yeah so and you know I was in a conversation with someone recently about um, the kind of the, how America commemorated the founding, uh, the founding in American memory. And it was kind of like, this is, this is a subject for another book actually that I'm working on is that we didn't really spend a lot of time after the war with that, with kind of uh, preserving battlefields or even creating, you know, pensions for veterans or monuments. And Lee very early on was doing that in, you know, he, there's not only the Nathaniel Green, but we, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but when he's in Congress uh, in 1800 after Washington dies, he leads the charge to fund and create a Washington monument. That's not the same one that sits on the mall now, but he very, very active in creating markers that would help future generations be able to look at Washington and emulate Washington or Green. So that's something I find really interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. I had no idea that he yeah. was... Yeah, because at the time, it makes sense that so many people were against monarchy and, and all of that thing. It makes it makes sense that they wouldn't necessarily be enthusiastic to celebrate individuals as opposed to, you know, you know, eventually yeah, they'd start you know, celebrating the Declaration and, the, and things like that. But yeah, it's amazing, especially to us now, how we, uh, you know, how our history has been taught to us. Is that if you look at the debates, and again, I'm kind of jumping ahead in our story. I'm going to 1800 when Lee is actually, you know, in Congress pushing for a Washington Monument. His primary antagonist in this debate is Nathaniel Macon, who's, and also don't forget, there's politics at play here because Lee at that point is, is a Federalist again, and Macon is a, you know, a Jeffersonian. So Washington's reputation is, you know, attached to the Federalists at this point. But there's a raging debate in Congress where Lee is saying, you know, we need to build this because future generations need to look at it and say, be like George Washington. And Macon is saying, no, what will happen is that future generations of leaders will look at that who are not as worthy as George Washington and say, I want my own monument too in the capital city. So it's an interesting debate about how the young republic resolves itself to uh, memorializing its leaders. And obviously Lee's, I think you could say Lee's view of things probably won out if you look at our, our mall. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's pretty easy to say. Well, yeah. I, if I'm not mistaken, Washington himself was not a fan of having, he didn't want his own picture on the money, I believe. I mean, it's been a long time since I learned that. I don't, I don't know that, but you know, it makes perfect sense. It comes like very, everything. very, very long ago. I remember hearing that. I should probably look it up. Don't call me on it. That but makes I, sense. I, I do recall that from my youth. Like I want to say when I went to Williamsburg as a kid, someone told me that. So maybe not. <laughs> but no. Uh, and and as for Nathaniel Macon, he was an early congressman from from Tennessee. Is it? North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay, fair North enough. Carolina. Yeah. 
Either way. So, so we did he's skip. Like, he's like a Ron Paul. He's like Ron Paul of his generation. No, no on everything. No on everything. Right. That's that's what I remember about him. I, I wrote an article probably three or four months ago about him. And, and I remember he just votes no. It's something along the lines is the title of the article. Nathaniel Macon votes no. <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah. That, there you but, go. So, yeah. And it's even funny. It's what's funny about, again, if you look at the debate, you look at the, the, uh, the minutes of the debate in Congress between the two of them, Macon actually throws out an insult at Lee about managing money. Because then we were talking about Lee's land speculation. By that point, he's headed towards bankruptcy. He'll be bankrupt, you know, in, in another decade. And Macon actually, you know, insults him on the floor of Congress about economy. That's pretty intense when dueling yeah. is still acceptable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, come on. I mean, what we have going on now is is nothing compared to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we should back up a little bit because we did skip at least one thing that's extremely important, and that is mm -hmm. the governorship. Yeah. Okay. The, he's a three-term governor. Right. Of which Virginia. I believe is the maximum. There were three one-year terms. Max? Yeah, and it's not a really you know we talk about governors now in terms of uh, is you know chief executives of states highly aligned with a political party, and it wasn't quite the same. Conceptually, it's not quite the same thing, but I think he he in office makes it more uh, of a political office. But he has those three years um, where he's and it's you know I love talking about Lee's personal stuff along with the political stuff because you know we mentioned he got married. Well, his wife dies shortly before he becomes governor. Not long after she gives birth to a child who himself dies. The child's name is Nathaniel Green Lee, actually. And um, so he's a grieving widower at this point in time when he becomes governor of Virginia. And he cuts a very dashing romantic figure because of it. And this is, again, we got to bring Washington back into this, is that this is, happens to be uh, coincide with the French Revolution. And Lee is kind of aimless. The job of being governor of Virginia is not quite exciting enough for him. So he is snooping around to figure out if he can get a commission to go over to France and fight, you know, and... Um, I believe he's offered one, and who does he go to to get advice on whether or not to take it? And of course, it's George Washington. And Washington, again, these letters are so wonderful. Washington very dispassionately says, you know, I can't really offer you any, you know, I can't offer you a great amount of advice, but I would encourage you to examine how it would look to the world if the chief executive of one of our biggest and most important states went and fought another country's revolution. Right. So Lee, Lee says, okay, this was just a moment of temporary insanity. I'm going to stay here. He ends up marrying uh, Ann Carter, another beautiful musical uh, Virginia, daughter of Virginia. And the and Carter he, family is in a, one of another, the major families. of so, yeah. Yep, yep. He marries very well again. And the thought is that he can now, this is a very restless person, right? Uh, that this, again, he will have, through this marriage, and I think Washington kind of expresses this in his congratulations, has found peace, and this is his future is in, looks incredibly incredibly bright. But again, in in this arcs I keep talking about, this also his last year as governor of Virginia happens to coincide with the Whiskey Rebellion, right? Which is a, we've probably talked about. It's a rebellion. I was going to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you know, I guess some of the stuff we talked before we even got on camera about keeping politics out of it, but I guess some of the stuff is some interesting parallels to, to stuff going on today. But, you know, we had a rebellion in primarily in the western part of Pennsylvania against excise tax because, you know, surplus of corn, you're out in the western part of the state, you don't have, everyone's in agriculture, you don't have a huge market for that stuff, so you right. make spirits with it. And there's a tax on this that uh, unfairly in the eyes of the city citizens of that part of the United States punishes them. So you have a, an uprising against this tax. Washington and Hamilton viewed it as the first real, you know, uh, threat to the, the federal government, to the new federal government, and they were determined to squash it. And who do they look to to lead the, you know, the army to subdue the Whisker Rebellion, but, but Lee? And I think just really quickly, not to get too, you know, uh, discursive here, is that what's interesting about this is that Lee, as soon Lee helps Virginia ratify the Constitution. He participates in Virginia's or ratifying a convention with Madison, and he's very much a proponent of the Constitution. But almost immediately after the, the uh, first administration, when Washington's administration is 
in place, he's horrified by Hamilton's plans, financial plans, because he feels obviously it's states like Virginia are being punished at the expense of uh, states that did not manage their money as well. And obviously, you know, he sees a, a, the uh, promotion of an uh, industrial economy versus agrarian. So he's very incredibly upset about this and turns. So he's no longer a federalist and he's kind of a allying himself with what would end up being, you know, the Democratic Republicans, you know, Jeffersonians. And what's amazing to me, though, is he still maintains his friendships with Washington and with Hamilton. It's never, it's never personal with them, but he's incredibly angry. And he even, you know, we talked a little, we look into the future here generationally, some of his correspondence with Madison, he even speculates about disunion and civil war. Now, he, he backs away from it because he said, you know, he, he had participated in a civil war. Revolution is a civil war, oh. right? I bring that up all the time over here. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So he eventually backs away from it and says, I don't want to participate. And I've seen brother killing brother. I don't want to participate. But he's estranged from the government and from the Federalist Party. But he gravitates back towards it, uh, you know, when Washington, Washington, these Democratic Republican societies start emerging in, in sort of Washington remaining neutral between France and England. And he's horrified by some of the responses to that, and he slowly gravitated back towards the Federalists. So by the time he's in, he's elected to Congress at the end of the, you know, beginning of the 19th century, he once again is a Federalist. So what's interesting about the Whiskey Rebellion was this is someone who did was not a fan of any of the policies that the rebels were, uh, were rebelling against. Largely, you could say that there was, he had some sympathies, sympathies with yeah, him. Yeah, he may he have agreed called, with them. Yeah. Right. But this is very late. Called to duty. He's going to uh, respond to that. And also, let's not forget, there's a little, always a little bit of ambition in here, is that if you're being offered, you know, uh, you're being put in charge of an army that's going to subdue this rebellion, right. there's this partly out of duty, but it's also partly out of, you know, military ambition. Right, because the Whiskey Rebellion out. is fairly famous for George Washington. People like to refer it's the one time a president has actually led an army into battle. That's right. But the truth that's is, right. he led them across Pennsylvania and then slow down and let Light Horse Harry take the lead when they actually got to the hostilities. That's right. Not trying right. to talk trash about Washington. He obviously knew he was a symbol as the first president and couldn't be taken out by some rando who should have otherwise easily been suppressed. You know, like, Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That's absolutely right. It's actually so, surprising to me Hamilton didn't take charge. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. You, you you read about the conduct. So the so the rebellion is subdued rather easily. You know, it's right. It That's why if Washington got killed. It would be really lame. <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. Um, I don't know all, how else to put it. <laughs> alternative U.S. history, but when when they when the rebellion is uh, subdued and Lee and Hamilton are in Pittsburgh after you know meting out justice the portrait that is painted is that lee is actually quite fair and uh you know offers a lot of grace it's hamilton obviously that's a lot more aggressive about this but making an example about those who would rebel against the government right. so i think hamilton obviously very frenetic behind the scenes of all this or whereas you know lee was i i you know if you look at the records and look at people's correspondence i didn't see a lot of negative um criticism of Lee's conduct. But, you know, again, we get into this kind of like cycle of Lee's life when he goes back to Virginia, which is now the balance of power is largely shifted to Jeffersonians. They're furious that he would be involved in leading this, what is perceived as this incredible overreach of federal power against, the, you know, a ragtag army of farmers, right? So he's removed from office. So you have this, this kind of successful military uh, enterprise is subduing this rebellion and he returns home and he's removed from office because the winds of politics have changed and he's out of favor. Right. And the, you know, to be fair, the whiskey rebels were in a, a winless situation because uh, in addition to what, what you had mentioned, how they were selling the, turning their corn into spirits. They also, Spain had control of the Mississippi and was not letting them send the corn down there. That's why they were forced to turn it into spirits because that's the mm -hmm. only way it would last the long journey over the mountains to the east and that expense did in fact make it more expensive for them than the wealthy coastal elites as they literally were at the time <laughs> absolutely and you know it's also this is a it was also a form of commerce 
in the frontier too. Right. And I believe you, you had, you know, uh, preachers that were paid by with with spirits. You know, right. it was used from a commerce. So, um, Lee, I think Lee, like I said, Lee's conduct was generally pretty well. It was praised, but when he returns home, it, it's just he's criticized pretty roundly for participating in this, and it's kind of he's out again, which is again, this is over and over again. Yeah, but, but as he, we said, he does end up getting elected to Congress anyway. Yeah, he gets elected to Congress. Um, and that is probably, I think, leads to, we would probably agree is the apex of his public life is that he is in Congress when Washington dies, okay, in 1799. He has just taken his seat in Congress. And when Congress is trying to figure out who is going to give the eulogy, it's obviously going to be a Virginia. And this is, um, he's, he ends up being the choice. Now, it's, I think the, the connection with Washington personal connection. He had also done a eulogy. This is Lee was, we, one thing we have not discussed, which is now is the perfect time to do so, is that Lee was incredibly eloquent. He's a great writer, great speaker. He had, when Washington left uh, Mount Vernon to go to New York initially to become president, he wrote this really stirring tribute from the citizens of Alexandria. When Patrick Henry died, just shortly before, you know, this period we're talking about, he wrote this incredibly stirring eulogy for Patrick Henry. So he was kind of the, the, the logical choice because of the connections and also this reputation as a eulogizer. So he ends up writing, he, he writes the set of propo congressional proposals. John Marshall actually introduces them, but Lee wrote them. And the language that we're about to discuss was in those, but Lee ends up being the one asked to deliver the eulogy for Washington. I should point out, it's a eulogy in the sense that Washington's body's not there. His body remains at Mount Vernon, but the, all the federal government is there. President Adams there, right? Congress is there. I think the Supreme Court, it all show up in, in Philadelphia for the ceremony and Lee delivers the eulogy for Washington. And we know that there's famous words from it, of course, are first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of uh, his countrymen. And I, I really feel like you may not know much about Lee. You may not know the particulars. You may, you probably know his son is Robert Lee, but I think that's the thing that's probably best remembered and, and has lasted through the ages is that, that formulation. That yeah, he, no, I want to reiterate, that is a really famous line that probably everyone watching this has heard. And I just want to make it clear that the, the line, where, where, and I'm going to say wrong, was it first in, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. It's one of the first, most famous yeah. lines in American history. Yeah, absolutely. And the here's the thing is that the entire eulogy is beautiful. That we know that line, but the eulogy itself is full of wonderful uh he takes the listeners all the way back to Washington's, you know, participation in the French and Indian Wars. He takes them to the revolution. He takes them to Washington leading the young republic and then at the end there's this beautiful I have some of it in front of me. I can read a little bit uh of it to you. I don't want to, I don't want to read all of it, but it's, um, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Give us a light. I'm going to sip my water. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> um, there's a lot. I don't want to read all of it. I would encourage your, your listeners. I mean, a lot of your yeah, listeners. I'll put a link down in the description below, which I'll say at the end too. There's also a link to Ryan's book about Henry Lighthorse, Harry Lee in the description. You need to check it out. <laughs> saying that, um, which is really what what is great at the very end of the eulogy he kind of takes the listener through washington's life and his service to the republic he um at the at the close which you know has the first in war first in peace and first in the hearts of his countrymen he brings he then says i think i see washington i hear washington right now so he brings washington back to life and he says you know i think i see his august image and hear falling from his venerable lips these deep thinking words cease sons of america lamenting our separation you know there there were common dangers to be confronted still there was knowledge to diffuse arts and sciences to patronize and party spirit to resist peace to cultivate and only by doing these things uh would the union in this is lee's words the constant object of my terrestrial labors the union be perpetuated so that's his close it's, a, it's great so again i encourage uh if you're your viewers and readers haven't read the whole thing to go back and read it. That's me. I'll definitely pull up a link and put it in the description. I'm sure. I'm sure it's somewhere for free. It's 250 oh, yeah. years old. <laughs> yeah. well, you, know, you know, what's funny about that is that it was obviously a smash. 
and and he probably could have remember he's in he's going deep in debt at this point and he's always in financial trouble but it's really starting to accelerate and he probably could have printed this himself and made a windfall from it but congress asks if they can print it and he gives them permission to do that so again it's another one of these kind of very lee instances in his life where there's an opportunity a moment of glory but he's never fully able to really capitalize on it right i do think that is fairly common though uh for a member of Congress, like, for example, I know Francis Hopkinson, when he designed the uh, American flag, he wanted compensation in a cast of wine. And they said, no, you're paid to be a congressman. So what you do in Congress, you're already paid for. So if it seems to me that that's a, that seems to have carried over a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Not that I'm trying to defend him not being rewarded he obviously could have published it himself but that's probably part of what's going through his and everyone else's mind yeah so, absolutely yep so he's in congress for a while um and then uh, how long well, how long is he in congress i should ask you he just serves that one term okay. he's, he's out when jefferson comes in in 1801 he's out and a lot of that has to do with this is one of the things I always love to say is that, you know, if you go to Monticello and, you know, you go in that entryway and there's a gallery of busts around, I guess, the front vestibule when you come into the house, people that, and I remember going in and seeing there was actually a bust of Hamilton. I remember thinking, you know, because you understand, you know, the, the nature of the relationship. Everyone watching this understands that there should not Everyone be a bust of Hamilton in Thomas Jefferson's house. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember I, think I, I asked or someone else asked the, the docent or the tour guide, why, you know, how, why is there a bust of Alexander Hamilton in Thomas Jefferson's house? And I think they said, well, they didn't like each other, but Jefferson had some degree of respect for Hamilton. Okay, there's no chance in hell that Thomas Jefferson would ever have a bust of Henry Lee III in his house. So I'm just trying to, to, to illustrate for your listeners, they hated each other. Jefferson hated the whole Lee family, but he hated Light Horse Harry Lee, and Harry Lee hated him, gave it back to him just uh, as much. He described Monticello as a, a grotesque mansion, incomplete mansion on the uh, spur of a mountain. Well, yeah, but he put a lot of work into it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all that to say is that when Jefferson comes in, you know, there's obviously the Jeffersonians have their moment right at the turn of the century and lee is an antagonist he he and jefferson hate each other and he of course he votes for burr when the election is thrown to congress and he's done that's the end of his political career right as, as the jeffersonians come in he's out he never is in any political office again he spends the next you know we're now into the 1800s he spends the next decade running from his creditors they didn't have time to be involved with with politics on that level. Although he's he's take he hates Jefferson so much, he's taking time out to write, you know, uh, pamphlets attacking personally attacking Jefferson. It was the cool and, thing and to do. Paying for it on credit, by the way, paying for it on credit, the, the parchment on credit. So, okay, so he digs himself into debt for a decade or so, and then we come to a bit of a tragedy. The War of 1812 starts to break out. Many people are in favor of it, and I understand Rich, uh, Light Horse Harry is not in favor He's of not. the war. He's not in favor. He thinks it's a terrible idea. Again, this dynamic Madison is president, and Madison is his old college friend, and they remain friends over the years. So he is against the war. He offers Madison all sorts of unsolicited advice. He remains civil with Madison, and he, if, if appointed to, uh, you know, if given a commission, he will participate because it's also a sense of duty and a sense of even at a, at a, at a you know, at this point, at a uh, no longer a young man still wants to participate. Now, one thing we, we step back just a second is that in the, the uh, interim between leaving Congress and the beginning of the War of 1812 is that he is when uh, finally his creditors catch up to him, he's, he's in jail. He's thrown a debtor's prison. Uh, and it's just a year or so before that, in 1807, he spends he spends a number of years essentially gone from Stratford Hall. Uh, Anne is alone at the house with their children. 
And it's actually during one of these periods where he's either trying to uh, find money, raise money, or he's hiding from creditors, is that a son named Robert is born in 1807 when uh, Harry is not around, is absent, which is very interesting. But he eventually has to go to debtor's prison. And while he's there, it's he writes- very his interesting. Memoir. I'm not sure what you're implying there. <laughs> Open to speculation, but- um, I'm sure he, he did might... return home briefly at times. He did return home briefly. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> You know, someone asked me at some point, I can't remember where it was, it was an interview or I don't remember someone, another historian wanted to know if I found any evidence of a philandering. And I never did. I actually never did. I never came across anything that implied that that was a concrete. Thing that would be very hard to find evidence for. <laughs> be hard to find evidence. But, you know, some of the, with Jefferson, for example, you know. Yeah, so I, I, can, I cannot. Jefferson's misdeeds are easy to find out. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But. He was not um, good at covering his tracks. He's by the time Lee is out, Lee writes his memoirs, which are about the war, which are mostly about the Southern campaign and the war while in jail. And he spends all this time corresponding with fellow veterans because there's some gaps in his own memory. So he writes letters to them saying, do you remember this? And they, uh, all the letters, most of them are preserved. It's really fascinating. So he, he writes this incredibly discursive, self-aggrandizing memoir of the war while he's in debtor's prison, he comes out He's kind of a disgraced figure at this point, you know, uh, he's busy trying, he hopes that the book will be a big hit and, you know, it'll be that windfall to be able to take care of his family. So this collides into the war. This is, this is all happening. And he, the family, he loses the uh, Stratford Hall. It passes to his eldest son, Harry Lee IV. Okay. So he takes the rest of the family, including Robert, and they move to Alexandria and Virginia at this point. So this is when th this period that we're about to discuss, this is, when the war of 1812 happens and i think we're we're heading to baltimore right right so he finds himself in baltimore and his friend owns a print shop that's Black right Church. alexander hansen who's a uh incredibly pugnacious uh, federalist uh newspaper editor who's been chased out of town for for criticizing remember baltimore a couple things that are really interesting baltimore is i believe at this point in american history is the third largest city in the country so baltimore is, is a, you know metropolis and it also is very very almost monolithically um jeffersonian whereas i think the, the rest of maryland is is like the, annapolis is more federalist sympathetic but this is this is a from the mayor to the chief of police this is a, a jeffersonian city so it's not a lot of sympathy for someone printing a newspaper criticizing the administration and right. the war which Hanson right? does Hanson does it on in very hysteric terms and, and you know <laughs> right. so he's, he's tossed out of town i think his printer is destroyed he leaves and he goes to georgetown and then he says i'm going to hell with this i'm going back right. and he sets up shop in a house and he surrounds himself with some some men and lee happens to be this kind of murky lee happens to be in baltimore i think he would say well i was there to play a game of, of cards or some there's some belief that he was there, you know, trying to secure a contract for his for his book, something relating to his book. But I think he went there to defend Hanson. I think he knew Hanson's Hanson. This you may have covered this. I believe Hanson's father and grandfather were both uh, involved in the revolution. I think his grandfather was in the Continental Congress. Maybe we'll have to have a fact checker on that. So Lee had a, f a family connection to Hanson that way. So I think he's there to. Uh, support Hanson. And what happens is outside of the home where they're all um, holding up, a crowd forms, gets bigger, goes on through the night. The local authorities aren't really doing a whole lot to stop them. There's, uh, you know, this agitation to bring Hanson and his friends out of the house. There's a standoff. Eventually what happens is there's, they try and storm the house. There's a, um, Eventually, a compromise is that Hanson and Lee and the others are going to be escorted from the house and taken. They are going to be relocated at the prison in Baltimore where they will supposedly be safe. Well, they right. get moved, and then someone lets in the mob. They pummel everyone, every one of the group. Lee is thrown down a flight of stairs. His nose is slit open. Hot candle wax is poured in his eyes. And you know, by the by the time this is all over, it's assumed he's dead. In fact, some of the, the newspapers coming out of 
Baltimore and Washington actually report that Lee has died in these riots. He does survive, but he's, he's uh, disfigured, completely disfigured. When he eventually returns, his body's taken away to York, but they, they steal it away to, to York where he recovers a little bit and he comes back to Alexandria. It's, there's incredible diaries of some um, children who attended Christ Church in Alexandria in an old town today, uh, seeing him sitting in a pew and describing him as looking like a monster. His head is wrapped in bandages. His eyes are black. His nose is split. And there's another great record of someone, an Englishman visiting uh, in Alexandria during Christmas, um, 18, maybe 18, 13. Um, encountering Lee at a restaurant or a hotel, and this, this monstrous man approaches this, their group having dinner, and it turns out he's this renowned military figure. Remember, he's a general at this point. He's made a general during the Whisker Rebellion. So this is General Lee, and he sits down at their table and starts talking about George Washington. You know, he's all these great stories of George Washington. So there's this weird thing going on in Alexandria is that people are encountering this, this monstrous-looking man who's just deformed and grotesque, but it's actually this old hero of the revolution. So right. you have this point where children are being told by their parents that, you know, they're pointing him out and saying this, this terrible looking man is actually a great hero. Right. It's very sad. Actually, it's an incredible, it's a That's tragedy. Inc I, I knew he, I knew he was pretty well beaten and I, and I understand he suffered from probably what we would call today PTSD yeah. from yep. the experience, but I had no idea that it's, Essentially, the ghost of Light Horse Harry was walking around Virginia. That's exactly right. That's I think that's a great way to describe it. And he wants to get out of there. There was this was something that was like reoccurring for a while. Is that the thought was, he had all these ailments, some of them pre-existing, the beating from the mob, that he wanted to get to a warmer climate. If he could get out of Virginia and get to the tropics, then it would have a healing effect on his health. And he spends quite a bit of time lobbying. Madison and then James Monroe is Secretary of State at this point, trying to get them to give him some type of assignment, whether it be you know to to join. A, a, I think there was there was an earthquake uh, somewhere maybe in yeah that the, America. In, oh I'm sorry I thought you were referencing the Saint uh, New Madrid in in Saint Louis. No, there was, there was, he's trying to, he's always trying to concoct some kind of excuse to get on a ship and sail into the tropics. And I think there's, there's, uh, you know, relief missions that are going and he's always trying to find a spot on them, trying to ask Monroe to get a spot on them. And he's continually refused. But finally in 1813, there's a note in the state department records I was able to find. He asks Monroe to for a pass to sail uh, south. Now remember the Chep Chesapeake Bay is blockaded during the war. He asked for the blockade to be lifted so he can sail to the West Indies. And the note is, is actually in the State Department records where M Monroe asked the general who's in charge of the Chesapeake Bay to let Lee pass. And he makes a point in the note saying, this is a of special interest to President Madison because of their relationship. Very interesting. That is interesting. His old college yeah, so he, he sails down to the West Indies and he spends the last years of his life drifting, grifting, preying off the kindness of strangers, writing in his diary, kind of rambling mad. Uh, some some of it is notes about politics, some about religion, some about history. The diary, by the way, is at the special uh, collection at Washington and Lee. You can go see it. You can go hold it. It's in an envelope. They have it. It, it was actually, it was, it somehow found its way to Robert E. Lee during the war during the civil war amazingly right so that so that's he ends he ends up what ends up happening is that in 1818 he runs into um a merchant in um providence and he says i got to go back to the united states will you take me and he, he agrees to take him back up he has to pay his clearest debts uh, you can't leave the island and you can't leave Nassau without paying your debts. He ends up getting a note of, he gets a, an old, a widow, kindly old widow who he was staying with, who was feeding him to give him the money. He gives her a note of credit to, at some bank he's never, he never actually had any money at. So he, he swindles an old, uh, an old widow 
out of Hermione to get out, back back home, and they, they sail back up north. And as they're passing uh, Cumberland Island off of Georgia, he remembers that that there's a dungeon. It's the home that was built on land that was given to Nathaniel Green. We're back to Nathaniel Green. That Nathaniel Green's daughter is living on. That built a home on at that point. He says, "Let me off here. I want to go die in the home of my my old general." And he's let off the boat, and he goes the island he spends his last days in the house and eventually dies there and is buried there and one of the great quotes is that a doctor comes and suggests a procedure his gallbladder i think was you know i think the primary cause was his gallbladder it was destroyed during the the riots and lee reportedly says about this procedure that could potentially you know give him a few more extend his life a little says even if george washington were here with you recommending this procedure i would still say no things got tough for a while yeah, yeah. so good. that's that's he dies there and um and then what's amazing is, becomes one of the major players in the civil war just 50 40 something years later yeah yep that's exactly right and he um robert e. lee visits couple times two times i think maybe three he actually visits once once on the eve of the war and then after the war he goes and visits his father who you got to remember like i said when when robert lee was born lee was mostly an absentee father then he spent that time in jail and then he was the last years of his life was completely separated from his family so to robert e. lee his father must have been was a lot of ways a mystery he didn't really know each other so it's another interesting part of the story right and then lee would have been still very young when 11 whole... 11 i believe 11 yeah that's yeah. crazy yeah well ryan this is it, it ends on a little bit of a down note but this has been one of the most fascinating conversations i've ever had thank you so much for coming to thank talk you. to me thank you. thank you for saying that yeah, yeah yeah absolutely uh please you know if there are any other founders you want to talk about come back and talk to us a little bit more yeah absolutely I have to i'm i'm um i'll, I'll tell you i'm writing a book now about Lafayette's return to America in 1824 and 1825, which is not the founding, I know, but it's a book about the ghost of the founding because Lafayette's return, we talked earlier about memorializing the founding, how the country didn't really get around to it. Well, I think this is the, that's the moment. This is the, the point in time where it really happens. So uh, that we'll, maybe we'll save that for a future conversation. We can save that for another conversation because from my perspective, that is the end of the American Revolution. That's when right. he, That's when exactly he returns because he literally comes to your town and you can come outside and say, there's the general and say goodbye to the war as he leaves. Say goodbye to the founding. We'll talk about yeah. that another time. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, you just, I've been trying to get an elevator pitch for this thing for, for the last year and a half. You just nailed it. Right oh, there. I got it. Oh, okay. We'll talk about it more. We'll talk about it next time. Uh, founder fans. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Uh, Ryan Cole is an amazing authority on Light Horse Harry Lee. A link in the description to that down below and also put a link to the eulogy of George Washington as we discussed. So make sure you check those out. Make sure you hit like because this video was fantastic and definitely subscribe if you want to talk about the American Revolution five days a week.